1939, we went to war, World War II. We didn't go to war, but World War II started in 1939. And we wanted to support our um, allies at that time through the Lend-Lease program. So we were sending materiel. We were sending ammunition and food and you know various things. And one of the things our allies wanted was an off-road vehicle that they could get around on the muddy roads and fields of Europe. And so a request went out for experimental prototype vehicles to be tested. At that time, only Willis and Bantam agreed to provide prototypes. Eventually, Ford jumped in as well because they were already doing a fair amount of government business, and they were reluctant to become involved in yet another world war, but in the end, they did. Uh, and most people are really pleased to have one, and to have one in restored condition. To have all three is, is pretty special. There are other places, military museums, that do have all three, but it's very, very rare. This is a Ford GPA. So I mentioned the allies and lend lease. Well, the Russians were our allies at that time, and they wanted in a small amphibious vehicle, primarily because the strategy during the war was to blow up the bridges as people either retreated or moved forward and take, the, you know, impede the flow of soldiers. So they wanted a small vehicle that could ford the, you know, narrow rivers and shallow lakes and creeks and so forth. So Ford built a GPA. Underneath is an Army World War II Jeep. It is a GPW. All they did was they put a very heavy steel boat body on top of it. But all the drivetrain, everything underneath is standard World War II GPW, luckily for us. I mentioned heavy steel. Part of the problem was that these sank with great regularity. They built 12,778 of them, and most of them are on the bottoms of Russian lakes and rivers. Okay. Here again, to have one in the U.S. is even more rare. Every seat cushion in here says life preserver, and they meant it. <laughs> there are two PTO levers in there. One operates the propeller, and the other is a bilge pump. And that bilge pump got a lot of use. Their camping equipment, their food, their medical supplies, you know, ammo, and everything was somewhere on this vehicle. And a camouflage net so that during the day they could get out of the sun and they could hide if necessary. But they were self-sufficient. They'd go out for up to a week at a time. The grill was cut out to prevent, provide better airflow, and the coolant recovery tank so that if they overheated, they could capture that antifreeze and put it back in. They didn't want to use their precious water to keep refilling the radiator. So they patrolled in what is now uh, Egypt and Libya. This is a M715. This is Vietnam era. This is 1967. It has the original tires. This is not an exceptionally rare vehicle, but it is unusual to find in this condition. So they built these from 69, 67 to 69 uh, when the Vietnam era uh, war was over. They surplused and donated many of them to fire departments, civil defense, and so forth. So they're not, they're not rare. But what happened is because they received them for free, they parked them out back, they painted them different colors for their use, and so most of them that you find are either, you know, peeling paint or rusty or, you know, missing critical components. So to have one that's all together and runs and drives nicely is good. This has been to SEMA. Those of you who have been to SEMA, you can imagine driving this through the halls of SEMA up over the carpets and having people scatter as you go. Um, 200, you know, it's got the tornado engine and it's geared really low and it's big and heavy and manual steering and so forth. This is a 1957 Willis fire engine. It was owned by PPG, Pittsburgh Plate Glass. It has 5,800 and some original miles on it. It was the plant fire truck. So what they would do is every Friday they'd fire it up, drive it around the plant twice, shut it off, just so that if there were a fire, it would run. It never left the plant. So from 57 to 92, all it did was drive around the building. They surplused it and went to a local used truck lot, and the retired fireman found it, and he decided to rescue it. So he bought it, took it home. He painted the exterior because the exterior just looked like crap from being outside for 35 years. But everything else is original. Original tires, original interior, original drive chain. Everything on it is original except the exterior paint. And it actually runs and drives pretty well because it's, it's nearly new. It's only got 5,000 miles on it. Uh, so this is an MB, okay, Willis MB. We took the best features of these three prototypes and standardized them into the MB. The MB was this chosen design, and then Ford started building their version, which was interchangeable with the MB. So you had two companies building essentially the same vehicle. There are differences between a Willis MB and a Ford GPW, but they're inconsequential from the perspective of the military. They wanted to be able to interchange parts in the field. They didn't want to have a, maintain a supply of Ford parts and maintain a supply of Willis parts. 
And so they were meant to be somewhat universal. This is a nice uh, early 42 uh, MB, uh, also from the Mark A. Smith collection. So World War II ended, the war to end all wars, right? Or supposedly the last war and all that. Well, we know that didn't happen. But most of these MBs and GPWs were left overseas, as we mentioned. Five years later, we're in Korea. So they had some leftover MBs, but not enough. And so they decided to update the design, and they created the M38. So this is the early 50s. This one's a 51. There are some changes. Even though it's still flat fender, it's, it has the second battery compartment in the cow because we were part of NATO at that point and the 24 volt. Um, it has the one-piece windshield and, you know, a few other things, but there's a lot of similarities between the two. This is patterned after CJ3A, okay? CJ3A came out in 49, and this one happens to be 51, but there were many, the windshields and so forth are all uh, very similar. Uh, you'll notice there's a machine gun on it. Um, what we've discovered is that not all Jeeps had machine guns, but most Jeep collectors like machine guns, so therefore they put them on there. <laughs> Uh, and so it's not uncommon to see uh, machine guns. That's another Browning 1919A. About this time, Jeep decided, well, we're going to go and we're going to create an uh, M38A1. Radically different vehicle, right? Much larger, rounded fenders, sculpted hood. There's a lot of differences between an M38 and an M38A1. So now it has the, both batteries in the cowl, so you have a much bigger battery compartment. You have a cutout in the hood for a snorkel. You have a dimple in the fender for a blackout light. I mention that because you're going to see that again when we move on down the line a little bit, and it, I want you to try to see if you can remember that. That machine gun is a, a firing simulator, so when we hook it up, it shoots flame and makes incredibly loud noise and scares the crap out of everyone around. And it's a great deal of fun, but we have to be very careful where we use it. We've shot it off in here, and the employees uh, in the warehouse uh, became very concerned. Let's just put that. Now we're going to kind of transition back to post-World War II. This is a 47 Willis 2A fire truck. So the war ends, right? Military contract ends. All these automotive companies now have to go back to producing civilian vehicles and get back into the market. GIs are coming home. They need cars. They haven't had new cars for four or five years. And so Willis was like, what do we do with what we've got? So they took MBs, updated it a little bit, and called it a CJ2A. Obviously, there's other things that went on during that period of time. It's an oversimplification. But essentially what they did is they took an MB, civilianized it, and in this case made it into a fire truck. This is a Boyer conversion, one of about 200. This also came out of the Mark A. Smith collection. Uh, one of the civilianization things they did is put the gas cap and filler actually on the side of the vehicle rather than under the seat. So you're still sitting on the gas tank, but at least you're not sitting on the spilled gas that came from filling it up. This is a true fire truck in that it requires a fire hydrant. So water comes from the fire hydrant, comes into the bottom of the pump. It's pressurized. You can see the pressure. It comes out here in the fire hose. You can control the pressure here. You can control the engine speed there. This, on the other hand, is a brush truck. It's self-sufficient. In the back is a tank, and they fill that up at the fire station, and they can go out into the fields or sides of the roads and put out small brush fires. It doesn't need a fire hydrant. So this is a city Jeep, if you will. This is a country Jeep. All right. Again, totally self-sufficient. Everything on the vehicle runs, drives, all the lights work, the sirens work. Uh, we have employees who sit in here sometimes, and we have to, like, you know, turn, disconnect the battery or something. Uh, but everything works. The PA system works, all that. Super winch. Uh, it likes the, uh, the fact that we still have the ox on there. All right, now we're going to move down to some more of the civilian vehicles. This is a CJ3B. A uh, so rather than invent a whole new engine, what happened was that uh, Willis came out with the uh, F-head engine. It's a taller engine. It's a more modern design. Instead of the old flat fender, it's an overhead desi uh, valve design. And so it's taller. Well, rather than recreate a whole new vehicle, they just made the hood taller, the grill taller, and the cowl taller, and said, ta-da! They were not going for the Lexus Awards where they rolled the ball bearing down the seams, okay? Was, these are very practical, utilitarian vehicles. And so the simplest thing to do was just to put a, a taller front clip on it and the front engine. I happen to own one of these. I have it at home in my garage. And it actually runs and drives, which is good. Um, one of the trivia questions that I often ask, if you come over here, especially for your non-Jeep you know, enthusiasts, imagine trying to figure out what all these shifters do. 
Okay. So the first is a transmission. It's a three-speed transmission. The next one over is what usually stumps people. It's a worn, gear-driven overdrive. Then the next one is high, uh, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive. And then the fourth one is high range, low range. So you can imagine as you're driving along trying to figure out which gear, which, which shifter is in which position and what you need to do next. This is a 1955 CJ5, first year's production. You notice it has the dual battery compartment. It has the snor uh, cut out in the hood for the snorkel, and it has the dimple here for the wiring to the blackout light. The only issue is this is a civilian Jeep. Okay, it never came with snorkels and blackout lights. They simply just took the M38A1 parts and put it on this vehicle. They painted it a pretty color, changed the grill so you had a little chrome, and said, ta-da, CJ5, brand new model. This is a super Jeep, okay? So one of approximately 300 built. Um, and again, you'll get the opportunity to drive this this afternoon if you will. Everyone asks, what's your favorite Jeep? Well, that's kind of like asking what your favorite child is, right? You know, This is one of my favorites. Um, because it is so 70s, it's with a psychedelic graphic. It's got a very loud 304 in it. It runs and drives nice. It's not an off-road model. You can see it's got street tires and a chrome bumper, but it's just cool. Um, so what happened was, at that time, in the early 70s, they had a model throughout called a Renegade. And on the side of the hood, it would say Renegade. And those of you may have, you know, some of you may have remembered that model. And part of that package was that they came with fancy aluminum slot mag wheels. The problem was they ran out of the wheels. The supplier was not able to keep up with demand, and they ran out of wheels. So their marketing geniuses, no offense, Hank, decided, well, what are we going to do? We're going to create a whole new model that no one's ever heard of, and we're going to call it a Super Jeep. Because, again, most of us here, I think, are kind of at least vaguely remember the 70s. And so, <laughs> you know, Yellow Submarine and all the, you know, stuff going on. And so they came up with these wild graphics, chrome bumper, street tires, because, you know, every true hardcore off-road enthusiast wants street tires, white interior with red and, you know, white top, and they sold 300. It was a marketing failure. It's not because it was a bad Jeep, but because they only built it for three months, they never really had the chance to get the word out to the public about this model. So after about three months, the alloy wheels came back in, and they went back to building Renegades. CJ6 has that same swoopy door, but it has a mixer panel in the middle, and you can kind of see they never even filled the seams. It's just an additional panel, um, and that was designed to give more uh, cargo room in the back. The U.S. Forest Service and other companies wanted additional cargo space and so this was the solution. In all other respects it's a CJ5. This is a Hearst Commando, one of approximately 100 built. That number is in dispute. Originally they were saying 100. We now believe it's more than that but it's still pretty low production numbers. So 71, um, these Commandos were not selling all that well and so Again, the marketing geniuses at Jeep were trying to figure out a way to improve sales. And so they decided to partner with Hearst, Hearst Shifters. Because, you know, again, in the early 70s, muscle cars, you had the Hearst 442s and the olds and so forth. That was a popular thing to do. So they partnered with Hearst and approximately 100 or more went over there. They got a Hearst shifter put in them. They got this incredibly ugly hood scoop put on. And that is the way it's supposed to look. It has a working tachometer in there, a la GTO. A lot of Hearst badges everywhere. The stripes, the, again with the chrome bumper, again with the street tires. They only sold 100 or so. So what is a marketing failure is a collector's dream because again, this is another unicorn Jeep. 47 wagon. So what happened after the war, right? All the GIs came back and what happened? The baby boom. Right? Birth control wasn't as good then as it is now, and people started having large families. And they needed a way to transport them around. So again, Willis, post-war, desperately searching for a market, and so they came up with this wagon. Now, what makes it, one of the marketing features they had was it was the first all-steel wagon. Prior to the war, they used a lot of wood, and those were known as woodies. But during the course of the war, they learned how to stamp large pieces of metal. So that roof is all one piece. The sides are all one piece. And so that was one of the features that they touted was the fact that it was all steel wagon. Um, this one is two-wheel drive because from 47 to 49, they were all two-wheel drive. And then 49, they four-wheel drive became available. And a few years later, they discontinued the two-wheel drive altogether. You can see the skinny bias ply tires. Um, very accessible. Interesting to look back at the 40s and say, lots of ashtrays because everybody smoked. 
There's ashtrays for the kids in the back seat. I can imagine them with their candy cigarettes. Those of us who are of a certain age remember those. Um, seat belts? Nah, we don't need seat belts. Steel dash? That works just fine. The small seat for the passenger flips and folds very easily, and it's actually quite easy to get into the back seat. Everybody touts four door, and I get that, but this vehicle is actually pretty easy to get in and out of. Lots of leg room, so forth. Um, the 47 wagon. This is a special beast. This is what we call a farm jeep. Now, technically, there was a farm jeep model later, but we colloquially call it a farm jeep because it was designed to be used on farms. So this is an early 46 column shift CJ2A. The column shift is significant. They only built like 2,500 with a column shift until they figured out that, that really didn't work very well, and they went back to the floor shift. The column shift with all the linkage and so forth that gets loose, they would get jammed between gears. And if you go to a show with me, and this is around, you'll find me underneath wiggling and jiggling linkages trying to get it to shift properly. Um, and that was happening even back in the in mid-40s. What we happened here is we were started to look for some farm implements that were used on Jeeps. And I started contacting some folks in my network and they said, well, we can do one better than just random implements. We've got a vehicle that has not been on the market yet, but is coming up for sale and it's got six implements on it. So we started talking and negotiating and so forth. It has a PTO winch, it has an underhood air compressor, it has a 200 amp arc welder, a sidearm uh, mower, a towing boom, and a buzz saw. Now, obviously, that's not how it'd be normally configured by the average consumer. The average consumer would go down to their Jeep dealership, order a CJ2A, and then there would be a checkbox of optional accessories, and they could pick and choose what they want. Some of the accessories were post hole diggers. So if you were putting in fences, you would get the post hole digger. If you were digging trenches, there were trenchers. If you were doing wood, you know, timber cutting, you know, they had the buzz saw. But the owner of this vehicle was so into the implements, he just put as many as he possibly could on the vehicle. So the Jeep itself is kind of like a rolling display of implements. You'll notice there's dual tires front and rear. Dual tires in the rear was not unusual, but dual tires in the front is very unusual. And what I would tell you is it's virtually impossible to drive. We purchased this uh, from a gentleman who passed away. We purchased it from his widow. Uh, it was about 80, 85% complete. We worked on it and got it ready and then went to SEMA. The widow and her daughters came to SEMA. We got them badges to get in and they sat in and had their pictures taken and they were ecstatic to have the opportunity to see their father slash husband's vehicle at SEMA on display and they were in it. So there's a lot of personal stories with these vehicles as well. Uh, we've had other sellers who came to SEMA to see their vehicle on display. 1978 J10 pickup, not an exceptionally rare vehicle. What makes this one special is it has 2,443 original miles. It's not to its first oil change yet. I put three miles on it because we had a historian for Levi Strauss fly in from San Francisco to see the Levi interior, take pictures of it, and I gave her a ride, again, it's not tagged, around the area, and she was ecstatic. She wasn't expecting to have a ride in it. <laughs> Starts and runs beautifully. Um, it's somewhat highly optioned, and it, it came with the brush guard and the light bar. It comes with a towing rear bumper, automatic air conditioning, of course, 360, uh, Levi interior. It was not your typical utilitarian pickup. 1990 Grand Wagoneer. Nothing rare or exotic or special about it other than it is one. Again, we have the matching pickup and wagon. These were real popular in the 80s and, and early 90s. This was the high-end luxury SUV of its time. The doctors, lawyers, and other professionals often liked these. It had features on it that at the time were considered leading edge, meaning the six-way power seats and the leather and the power rear windows and so forth and so on. Um, if you've ever driven one, it's like driving a, a yacht that doesn't, you know, that kind of floats along and doesn't really turn very well. 